Hello, my name is Dr. Peter Megdahl, and I'm going to talk to you about the ins and outs of cardiac stents. Are cardiac stents necessary? The short answer is yes and no. Although it's a complicated question, and the answer can be even more complicated, the most accurate and most straightforward solution is this. You're having a heart attack? Yes. No for anything else. Here are a few facts. There's a lot of money to be made with cardiac stents by hospitals, cardiologists, drug companies, and of course, medical device manufacturers. The first bare metal stents were invented in 1986 and FDA approved in 1992, while in 2003, the first drug-eluting stents were approved. According to iData research, approximately 1 million stents a year are inserted into coronary arteries in the United States alone. Stents are a $5 billion industry annually, according to global data. Between 2000 and 2006, a world record was set, as reported by the Guinness Book of World Records, with 34 stents being placed in Emil Lohan's heart. What are stents anyway? Stents are tiny metal scaffoldings that are used to force open narrow atherosclerotic arteries. Many improvements have been made in the technology over the years. As of 2018, we are on our fourth generation of stents. The metal scaffolding mesh has gotten narrower, which promotes the growth of a monolayer of endothelium called endothelialization, or the ability for arterial tissue to cover up the metal stent. This is necessary for healthy blood flow in the artery and for preventing blood clots from forming in the stent, also known as instant thrombosis. These new stents are also more flexible to bend into tiny arteries, thereby facilitating placement. The most essential function of the drug eluding stent is to prevent the stent from becoming clogged with the rapid overgrowth of arterial tissue, also known as neointimal hypoplasia. However, as seen in Figure 5, there is a significant trade-off for this protection with the increase of potentially deadly instant thrombosis. This is what happened to my younger brother who died. Clots can also form in the stent due to incomplete apposition. The stent does not fully deploy or open when inserted, leaving a gap that may, may never endothelialize. In the mid-80s, physicians used balloon angioplasty to expand the artery without using a stent. A tiny balloon at the end of a catheter was inflated to simply push the plaque out of the way, making the artery wider. This technique was less effective, and most arteries soon returned to the previous diameter or worse. Therefore, stents are now used. Stents cannot be removed. The newest technology are bio absorbable. The stent material is eventually degraded and absorbed by the body disappearing over time. And drug impregnated balloon angioplasty. The results of these techniques are approaching that of modern stents but have not yet proved superior. However, their advantage is that no permanent structure is left in the artery. They coat the inside of the artery with an agent similar to drug eluding stents. The drug sticks to the wall facilitating the patency or openness of the artery. Years before the development of drug eluding stents, bare metal stents were the only type on the market. The older bare metal stents had a tendency for generating overgrowth of arterial tissue endothelium called neointimal hyperplasia, clogging the artery. This occurs most often in smaller arteries and with diabetic patients, which is what happened to my father. The newest drug eluding stents use much narrower scaffolding and have a polymer coating on the metal. The polymer is impregnated with a chemical, usually a chemotherapy agent like paclitaxel that prevents overgrowth of tissue around the stent that can sometimes block the artery. The drug elution usually lasts only a few weeks. The newest stents on the market have a dissolvable polymer. So after a few months, the drug goes away and the polymer coating then resorbs to allow bare metal underneath the tissue. This is advantageous because the polymer coating on earlier models tended to cause dysfunction in the endothelial tissue surrounding the stent and may cause blood clots to form, like an in-stent thrombosis. It seems that the metal itself does not have the effect of disrupting the endothelial function once the tissue has fully endothelialized. The newest fourth generation stents with dissolvable polymers 
have a much lower rate of instant thrombosis or clotting. An unforeseen side effect of the drug-eluting stents is that they still have a higher probability of having clots form in and around the stent, even though the side effects of the tissue overgrowth has been virtually eliminated. The prospect of instant thrombosis is an incessant danger, so there is some trade-off there. Unfortunately, anybody that has a stent must be on antiplatelet therapy for life, usually in the form of aspirin, but dual antiplatelet therapy also. This is typically a combination of clopidogrel and aspirin, and it's needed to stop clots from forming, especially when the stent is new. Sometimes these patients have to stay on this protocol for life. The newest guidelines are for six months of dual antiplatelet therapy, but there is increasing risk of dangerous bleeding with this therapy, even with aspirin monotherapy. So there is some long-term concern for stents from the perspective of anticoagulation therapy. Evidence has mounted over the years, and the consensus is that there is no advantage for having a stent unless a person is undergoing acute coronary syndrome, otherwise known as a heart attack. The COURAGE trial determined that there is no advantage to stents versus optimal medical therapy, which is using the best-in-class drugs instead of a stent. In 2017, the Orbita trial was completed, which should have put the nail in the coffin for most stent procedures. Orbita clearly demonstrated when patients were given a stent or a procedure mimicking a stent, a sham procedure, there was no difference for exercise tolerance or symptoms like chest pain. Orbita, the first placebo-controlled trial ever done. The overarching message is that unless you're having a heart attack, stents don't show any improvement over optimal medical therapy. A 2015 update in JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, concluded that nearly 80% of all cardiac stent procedures were initially unwarranted according to the current guidelines. Here is a quote from the study authors. This systematic review reaffirms the absence of scientific evidence for an initial strategy of using a stent in stable coronary artery disease. Despite the evidence, stents are used commonly as initial treatment for stable coronary artery disease. For people who are asymptomatic or have stable angina and are not on optimal medical therapy. Essentially, they are saying the medical community is lagging behind the science and physicians just keep stenting patients unnecessarily. And this is before the Orbita study, which came out showing that most of the benefit of stents is from the placebo effect. Bottom line, not enough reason to have this invasive, dangerous procedure before all other avenues are explored. Interestingly, no study to date has looked at both the combination of whole food plant-based diets combined with optimal medical therapy. Dean Ornis, Satish Gupta, and Caldwell Esselstein have all revealed remarkable cardiac benefits of a low-fat whole food plant-based diet alone or in combination with other lifestyle changes, lowering angina chest pain by over 90% of patients, decreased plaque in arteries, and reducing heart attacks. Work needs to be done on combining these interventions with drug therapy. This is precisely what I've done with myself, combining the best of both worlds, showing in my own arteries a rapid reversal of the disease and substantial increase in my own exercise performance. 